is one of the aspects of that story helps is, is it focuses your attention, right? There's a, there's a certain amount of cortisol that, that is evoked in our brain when we care about a character or a situation and we're worried, right? Which is why trouble is the center of story because it, it completely focuses our attention. We live in this attention economy where our attention is so scattered. When I'm doing innovation work with companies, we will use science fiction storytelling to help develop the customer of the future or the product of the future or what the world is that people are gonna be doing. So it's an innovation strategy. I don't know if our brains evolved because we use story all the time or story evolved because of the way our brains are, but mm. either way, they're so intertwined. Intuitive storytellers can learn detail, connection, and trouble, basically attention building. And those, those three things elevate your storytelling practice. One thing no one knows about you. I used to sit under tables when I was a kid and read books at family events. Fellows, welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Just Ravi. Subscribe to my channel for conversations at the edge with thought leaders from the branding, marketing, and the business world. Conversations that ignite new ideas, ideas with rough and sharp edges. Hi, Michelle. So nice to have you on my show. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. If I requested you to tweet your profile, what would you say, Michelle? I am a troublemaker training change shapers to create the self, world, or organization they want to see. Isn't that awesome? So uh, this is a territory of creation, story, and uh, everything that comes with it. And we'll go deeper with you, Michelle. Uh, First of all, I want to understand, uh, and I think it will be very important for all the marketers, all the brand builders, communicators to get this in perspective, especially where performance metrics, e-commerce, and social media is becoming so important. This whole idea of you need emotion to make a decision and stories evoke emotions. Could you please put this in perspective for our audiences, how decision is impossible without emotion or feelings? Absolutely. So first of all, nobody needs to tell marketers or communicators that storytelling is important, right? I spend my life telling other people <laughs> that storytelling is important, um, but marketers and communicators already know that. But what they may not know is the why. Like, why does it matter? Why is it important? So I love data. I love data. I am a data geek and, you know, you can't give me enough data, but it doesn't help us make decisions because it is emotionally flat. It's the feeling about the data as it is the feeling about anything that helps us make decisions. And I think part of what got me into this like field of research was a while ago, there was a book came out and, and one of the things that the author who was a neuroscientist talked about was that he worked with a man who had formerly been a lawyer and had had some brain damage and that damage had affected the part of his um, brain that allowed for emotion. So he could remember everything, list everything, do everything he could do before, but they couldn't, he couldn't decide when they should have their next appointment. And the, the neuroscientist was like, this is really interesting. Like what's going on here? He could list all the potential times and all the positives and negatives about those potential times, but couldn't pick one. And so that researcher um, said, obviously there was something going on where the feelings help to help us make decisions. And that was a long time ago. I, I think the book came out probably over a decade ago. But what, what we've learned since is that those that feeling function in your brain helps you know this or A or B, A or B. So when you do like A, B testing, what you're really testing is how people feel about something, right? You're not testing, well, I've thought about that color of blue and it reminds me of three Dutch paintings. And so, you know, like nobody cares. <laughs> so you're, you're trying to evoke feeling because feeling is what causes almost all of our memory, our decision-making, our change-making, our behavior change, right? It's all about feeling. That is so powerful. I mean, I mean, this itself is so vast and deep. 
So we understand we human beings have feelings. That's uh, in a way unique to us, the way uh, the richness of feelings perhaps or, or uh, the range of feelings uh, away from instinct. But how is this linked to brain and how is this linked to decision making and change? Uh, because what we are admitting, uh, you know, this whole behavioral science is bringing to the picture that our brain processes in uh, patterns, our brain seeks narrative, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it will find a narrative if, if it's not there and it will, you know, make a narrative. So how is this all happening for human beings when it comes to decision making and why is feeling at the center of it? So I'm not sure we know the why, but we know the landscape, right? So there's this concept in economics of the homo economicus, right? Like the, the, the person who behaves with perfect self-interest, with all the data, making good decisions. And what economists know is that just doesn't happen. Like it doesn't happen. We don't make those decisions and we, and we don't do that because what we're swayed by is what we pay attention to, right? And that is one of the aspects of that story helps is, is it focuses your attention, right? There's a, there's a certain amount of cortisol that, that is evoked in our brain when we care about a character or a situation and we're worried, right? Which is why trouble is the center of story because it, it completely focuses our attention. We live in this attention economy where our attention is so scattered and story is the thing that says like, you know, if I could whistle, I would whistle, right? Like over here. So, so story does that. And then the other thing it does is it creates connection. And that connection releases oxytocin, which makes us feel good. And our brains want to feel good, right? So we're just like the little rats in the maze where they gave them, you know, a, a little pedal to push. And when they push that pedal, they got something that tasted good or felt good. And they'll just go keep pushing that pedal forever, right? Um, we are those animals in our brain. And so we want to feel good. And so story also does that. It helps us feel connected to somebody or something bigger than ourselves. And that connection, which, you know, could be described, especially in marketing and social media stuff as a parasocial relationship, it feels good. And so those two things, we're going to make better decisions about the things we focus on and learn more about. And we're going to choose the thing always that makes us feel better. Like, you know, it, it, that's part of the problem with health, like health behavior change or, you know, trying to talk to people about climate change. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> and so people don't want to talk about it and they don't want to focus on it. And so their decisions are made kind of by like avoiding, avoiding mm -hmm. discomfort. And that's why Elon Musk is doing something right, making the car aspirational and cool. So you want to talk about it, you want to own it, and it's, it's, it's not something you want to avoid. Now, this is beautiful, uh, Michelle, isn't it? Because uh, we are not like a computer. Our brain works differently, you just said. So there are uh, common aspects, like there is a short-term memory, there's a long-term memory, there is an input, you'll process it, you can retrieve it. But we are an ignoring machine. So out of we will not rationally evaluate what is there. And like just you said, our uh, attention will get focused on uh, like e either a trouble, which makes us feel something or a connection because we want to feel connected with the larger, uh, larger um, consciousness in some way. Uh, so so before we get to change and uh, resilience, which is such a huge topic and change, because we're facing so much change and we want to create change and we want to create behavior change. I mean, at every little point, change is such an important topic. But before that, this is something I'm very curious about. That So story at a very basic level is uh, before, during, after, perhaps, past, present, future, perhaps, you know. And, and I mean, I, I'll take your views on that also. You have a beautiful uh, three-part structure uh, to that. But apart from that, is there any archetypal uh, kind of stories that we humans uh, connect with or, because there's, there's already a pattern in our brains or something like that? 
Yes, absolutely. And, and I think this is probably what your listeners are really good at and don't know why it works. So let's talk a little bit about that. You, you, you just did it. There's a three-part narrative. All narratives kind of come in three parts, before, before during, and after, you know, or, or however you want to describe it. And that three-part narrative is what makes stories work. So you have like the setup which lets you learn about the character, know what's going on, right? You have this rising action that creates both tension, which is cortisol and focus, and it creates oxytocin because you're learning about the character and seeing them succeed or fail. And in that period of a story, you're learning because they're trying and failing at things, they're failing or succeeding. And with each thing, we our bodies don't know the difference between it's happening on the screen and it's happening to us. I mean, if you've ever been watching a, a, a chase scene in a movie and you find yourself like at the edge of your seat, holding on to the pillow, like, oh, it's not happening to you, right? You, you know, if you look up from the computer screen, you can see you're still like in your living room, but your body doesn't know the difference. So we get to learn from that middle part of the story. And that's really a great benefit, right? Is that you can help people have experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise, which helps them develop more consciousness about diversity. It helps them to understand what kinds of behaviors might not work. And you should ask me about that because there's a great telenovela from, from um, South America that I can talk about. And then the third part is like, what happened because of that, right? Like what, what's the result? And when we're especially talking about change behavior, people understanding what the result is, first of all, there's relief, right? We oh, the person survived the story, the trouble was resolved, but there's also learning in that third part. So that we, we talk a lot about this three-part story structure that was first described by a guy named Gustav Freytag, if you want to Google him, it's F-R-E-Y-T-A-G, and he, it's his arc of narrative, and I use that, but I just divide it into those three parts because that's how our brain works, and every good commercial every good piece of social media jumps in there somewhere. It might only tell you the result, but you get a hint at the beginning, or it might only tell you the middle, but you get a hint at the beginning and the end. And those kinds of arcs are what draws our attention. There's a researcher by the name of Paul Zak who does some research um, on the, the, he's the one who realized that oxytocin and cortisol were the two things that story brought up. But he talks about the change to pro-social behavior, meaning people will donate money or do, donate time or give help based on what they learn in a story. And so he said, it has to have those three parts. It has to have a character, it has to have trouble, and it has to have that arc of narrative in order for people to change their behavior or their values or their understanding. So the learn uh, slash experience, is it like in the same so you experience something different from which expands and connects. So I have a very good friend who's a, who's a neuroscientist and he will tell you what I'm about to tell you is complete baloney, just so we're clear. He, we don't actually know why it works, but I'm gonna give you some ideas about why it might work, right? There's a whole bunch of functions in your brain that allow you to bring up feeling and experience as though it were real. So we know this from say, looking at PTSD because people have flashbacks mm -hmm. and they really don't know the difference between what's going on um, during the flashback and what's going on in their real life. And then that's something that researchers are looking at a lot because that function is actually the same as that storytelling function, except it's the storytelling function gone like against us, it's not working for us anymore, it's working against us. So that's one way people describe it. Another way people describe it is that we have these things called mirror neurons, which were discovered interestingly by some Italian researchers who were doing some research with a monkey and the monkey was all hooked up to stuff. And one of the researchers on a break from the study was eating a banana and they noticed when they looked at the, the brain of the monkey, that the monkey was responding as though they were eating a banana because they were watching the researcher eat the banana and they were like, what is that about? So that changed their research and they started looking into that. Um, that could be part of it. There's a lot of ways, you know, we're trained to create connection, like affective emotional connection. And so when people are telling us a story, there's also a thing called speaker listener neurocoupling, which is where when you and I 
are talking, our brains start to move together. So my story affects your brain the way, same way it affects my brain based on that. So those are three guesses as to why it works, right? We don't really know. And I just want to tell Mark Hurwitz, I'm sorry <laughs> that I'm doing this, but yeah. we, we don't know, but there's some really good guesses. And, and also, you know, like uh, Daniel Kahneman has written uh, this whole thing of thinking fast and slow that uh, the brain wants to, the brain is in automatic mode all the time. It wants to conserve energy, decrease cognitive load. So, uh, you know, it's going to quickly make connections to uh, comprehend, you know, to understand. And that's why if it's a narrative, it's easier because, you know, the context is getting built and they can. Uh, so is that another uh, aspect to it that we we like stories because our brain finds it easier to process. Our brains are pattern making machines. And this yeah. is another thing that and talks about a little bit. I th- and so we want to see a pattern. And when our brain gets a pattern, it goes, oh, thank you. Like, thank you. Now it's not just a lot of stuff I have to remember. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that happens is from the stories you listen to and, and the stories that are lodged in your memory, it allows the fast thinking. Because now you have an experience, that an opinion, even though it didn't really happen to you. So the interesting part is that the stories set us up for decisions in the future. So that's something to think about. You know, I'm working with a marketing person right now. And she said to me, people have to see your story seven times, right, before they are going to make, make a decision based on it. And I said, exactly, <laughs> right? Because the story primes you for the later decision. So you know, when you, you have such power, right, as a marketer or a communicator to prime people for all sorts of things. And I would put my pitch in here for like, make sure you're using it for the good. So you can be selling anything, but if you can prime people for feeling good, for feeling empowered, for feeling positive about changes that they're making, you know, you have the power to use those stories and it will still have the outcome of them purchasing the product. But I noticed the first time I really noticed this, it was a straw company, that portable straws. And their stories were so awesome. And like they told the stories from the point of view of the sea creatures who didn't choke on the plastic straws, but it was funny, engaging, hysterical. And I just thought like, that's it. Because they make you feel good about the decision you're making. You're having a great time. They're educating you a little bit in a way that helps you make other decisions about say environmental stuff better and you bought their product. So like that to me is incredible success. So now you, you've raised this, uh, this whole, it's a segue in itself where story, culture and change, you know? So if you could take, because culture, we know how important is culture, you know, I mean, more important than strategy and, and it's, it's everything, I mean, in, in an organization. So how is story leading to that? Why is it a critical element? How does it actually function? Recently, it probably was like 2006, but it feels recent to me. Google did a whole bunch of um, research that they call re- the rework program. And you can, Google, you can Google it and learn all about it. But one of the things they talked about was psychological safety in the workplace and creating cultures of psychological safety. So how do you do that, right? Because the outcomes that they described from psychologically safe workplaces were creativity, innovation, better teamwork, you know, stronger team building, more willingness to take risks, like all the culture that you would wanna have in an organization. They said, they said um, kind of came from this idea of psychological safety. Mm-hmm. And story helps with a lot of the, culture making that gives us psychological safety. So living in this world right now, there's none of us are not experiencing trauma in some way or another. I mean, we've been through COVID where, you know, the news is saying we're heading into a recession. There's a war going on right now as we're recording this, right? Um, In Europe, there's heat waves, like we're experiencing trauma. And then for people who've experienced intergenerational or systemic trauma, right? Everyone's showing up at work with some amount of trauma. And what you see when you're in a workplace where people go, no, you know those people at work. Like it's my job to work with those people at work, but you know them where their response to everything is always no. The first thing you have to realize is like, they don't really wanna feel that way either. 
right? That they're, they're experiencing some kind of trauma. It could be too much change at work. It could be fear of losing their job. It could be something that's going on outside of work, but they are not responding from a place where they're flexible, connected, and creative. And when you see that, along with feelings and frustration, you can kind of assume there's a trauma response in it. One of the things that story does is it circumvents that trauma response. So if you give somebody data, they will argue with you. If you tell them what to do, they will shut down or fight you, right? Depending on their, if they're a fight or flight kind of person or, or they'll appease you if they're kind of a freeze and appease person. But if you allow them to draw their own conclusions, nobody argues with their own data. Right. So if they can draw their own conclusions and you use story and whether it's telling the story or being a good story listener and asking them the right questions. Right. Because there are story questions that you can ask them. They will draw their own conclusions, which will be better because, number one, you didn't put them in a fight, flight, freeze thing. Number two, story helps us co-regulate. So, you know, we're on Zoom and, you know, but talking to somebody like you feel a little better even on Zoom, right? And so that co-regulation of your nervous system also helps people calm down. People do not co-regulate when someone is telling them what to do, right? Or telling them what's wrong with their behavior or their decisions, right? That that is not going to do it. But story does that. So it, it, it gets around the trauma response. It helps us to co-regulate our nervous systems. And it helps us to build attachment to each other, which is another way of thinking about how to deal with trauma is that there's often attachment issues. And so you're helping people be, form bonds and people will do more work and with people that they feel close bonds with, but they will also be more creative and innovative and willing to take risks. So story does all of that. Now, does that mean that your CEO gets up and tells like jokes at the podium? No, (laughs) but does that mean that like as a manager, a leader, a team leader, you find ways to elicit story from people, tell stories to people, listen to your customer stories, like all of those things will allow you to make better changes in the face of what organizations really are dealing with right now. And so that psychological safety, which we could call, you know, trauma aware business, you know, activity, that that stuff is what's going to allow people to be better equipped to interact with the folks on their team. If, if you had to bring in resilience in this whole thing, how does that work? And why do you say that this is good for bottom line of the business? Do you want me to say resilience first and then bottom line of business? Yes, yes. Resilience is cultural. You are able to bounce back based on the resources you have at your disposal, your mental state. Storytelling really, 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 really helps because it helps you to tell your story. It helps you to hear stories of how other people do things. It gives you possibility, right? So on an individual level, it helps you. But then resilience is also a cultural thing. And that's the part I think that's left out, which is like, Mm. if you have at your disposal support and resources, resilience is easier. So when you try to talk about resilient people in the workplace, always think also about a resilient workplace culture, where you provide people with the things that they need. Because in so doing, you shorten the time it takes them to recover from a bad review or something going wrong with a software release, right? Or or whatever their issue is, they will bounce back better if they have emotional support, you know, things that that just seem so small, but, but those cultural things, and this works in the larger culture too, right? That if you have more access, you have quicker resilience. So I just want to say it's not all located inside the person. Some of it's located in the culture. Okay. So why does this help a business's bottom line? Let me give you an example. There are two young folks who I mentor who are both um, data analysts and do, um, do programming at two different companies, one in the US and one in Canada. So the one in the, in the US got a review from his boss that was basically, you stink. Here are all the things you're doing wrong, fix it. Smart, smart, smart kid doing, working really, 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 really hard, right? Um, And he, his response to it was like, forget it. Like, I don't want to deal with that. And I I don't want to, you know, 
I just don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm just going to shut down. I'm going to work a little less, you know? And, and I said to him, why don't you go back to your boss and ask him to, to tell you, like, how is this impacting people? What is it that you would like me to do? Like to make it into a story, right? What happened? What can I do about it? And what would the result be, right? The three storytelling questions. So his boss was really unwilling to engage in that way, right? It was just like, fix these things. Okay, that's person A. Person B, nice, lovely, same age, young woman doing same work, but in, in Canada. Her boss came to her and said, oh, you're having a little bit of trouble with some stuff because you're newly out of college. I remember when that happened to me, right? When I first graduated and I was taking all this academic stuff and turning it into understanding real world work, there was a gap. So let's explore what your gap is and then we can fill it in. And so she came to me and was like, I love my boss. She totally understands where I am. And proceeded to like buy books and like jump in and find mentors in the organization who knew the things she didn't know and all the problems that she had because everybody, you know, coming in new from college is going to have the same barrier, which is like what you learned in school has nothing to do with what you're doing. Right. But the, but the barrier was completely closed by her just saying, oh my gosh, I so remember that you get out of school and everything, you know, and, and all she did was empathize and tell a quick story and, and frame it as a challenge. Right. And that's the great part about that middle part of story. It's always a challenge. There's always trouble. You can't have story without trouble. Right. So when you put the trouble in that perspective, people are going to say, I'm up for this. I'm the hero of this story. Like, let me fix this. Whereas if you just say, here's the data, you aren't doing X, Y, and Z, right? Fix it. It's crap. You know, it doesn't work. People are less likely. So which worker, which, which person do you want as an employee? It's a no brainer. So, yeah. Right. It's a no brainer. And, you know, yeah. there was a bunch of research that came out about uh, five years ago about how employees who are not actively engaged take more time off. They're less likely to get as much work done. They have more sick days, right? So employee engagement research, really nobody knew how to fix it, right? Like, mm -hmm. yay, let's have like a fun party at work. No, you need managers and supervisors who are trained to emotionally engage with the folks that they work with. I would say through story, and that's all the work, consulting work I do, right? And help people to be that kid who got the story and therefore isn't going to call in sick, isn't going to leave early, isn't going to play video games in the middle of the work day, right? Is going to be completely and totally focused. And, and that's, that's how it impacts the bottom line. So if you look at all that employee engagement research, mm. you, know, you now know how to fix it. Each one of us needs training in this. <laughs> And the training is fun. It's not like going it's, to the It's desert. really fun. Yeah. And if you once get the, you once orient yourself, every time you're presenting data or, uh, yeah, like, like you're talking to your teenager or, <laughs> or to somebody who's reporting to you, I mean, you can have that perspective because you know that that's how the brain is going to process. And like you said, in that story that you shared, she posted it as a challenge and she left it open to what next impact will be. So mm -hmm. she owned it and she said, okay, I'm going to be the writer perhaps from now on. How am I going to shape it? You know? Right. So that was. Yeah. And it comes up like people say, okay, well, so what exactly do you mean? Okay. I, I, I work in a company. What do you mean by storytelling? So I've had to think about this a lot, right? When I'm doing innovation work with companies, we will use science fiction storytelling to help develop the customer of the future or the product of the future or what the world is that people are going to be doing. So it's an innovation strategy, right? To use storytelling to, to, do, to build a world and then to figure out how we, we cover that gap between where we are now and the world we think is going to happen. And science fiction, they're doing a lot of research that says that that often does actually help us create innovation, even though it doesn't look like we're still not like riding around with rocket packs, you know, floating off the ground, but it helps us to see possibility, right? So that's one way. But once you've been trained to do it that way, it creeps into your PowerPoint presentations and your, you know, way that you will explain to a client what your, what your um, 
product does because you do, you start to learn to build the future for them so that they can see themselves in this better future and and see you as a as a helper on that path right so just doing one science fiction storytelling workshop will teach people how to use it everywhere this is this is so amazing to uh, you know to keep this in mind always that uh, I'm communicating and I can say it better and the other person gets it better if I weave a story. And, mm-hmm. and hence, the story word itself is misunderstood, I would say. You know, like it's, it's not fictional. It's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern of uh, arranging facts, perhaps. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a store. It's a store. <laughs> you just said it better than I've ever said it. It is a pattern of arranging facts and data. That is brilliant. Can I use that? Please. And it's a store. <laughs> it says story. So it's going to store. It's, it's, it's like yeah. a vessel. Mm-hmm. It's a visual or a meme. It's, it can say a story because if it's suggesting a before and an after, like a, like a ship that's sinking, perhaps, you know. Mm-hmm. It's so telling. Right. <laughs> that's perfect because you, you get tension. Yeah. Immediately, like, what's going on? I don't understand. Like, uh, this, somebody's in danger, right? Trouble is happening. And people immediately get focused on that. And mm. especially if then you were to cut to, you know, an individual person and their experience, right? Now you've got both things. You've got connection and danger. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got people's full attention. Yeah. Um, but, but I think people write off storytelling as like, oh, I tell stories to my kids before bed, or my grandmother told me stories. And I would say, don't, don't write them off, right? Both of those things. Mm. Um, because we're so, I don't know if our brains evolved because we use story all the time or story evolved because of the way our brains are, but mm. either way, they're so intertwined that yes, your grandmother did it. Yes, you did it for your children, <laughs> but it's something that you, if you don't do other places, you're missing out on how your brain functions and how the mm. brains of the people you're speaking to function. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, uh, I think both are true what you just said. It's like, it's unique to us human beings, isn't it? The story, I mean, maybe yeah. that makes us human. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting thought too. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure my dogs do not tell stories. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think it's a, it's a uniquely human thing and it's a uniquely like intimate cultural bonding mm. that we do, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So, Michelle, now uh, the personal stories. So that's okay. another thing that uh, I don't, I, I think if you just got that, it would be huge because we are anyways telling stories to ourselves about our lives, which way it's going. Uh, you know, it, it could be depressive or it could be uplifting and we might not even be aware. You know, we might be doing it subconsciously, but to, to imagine how powerful it can be to have a to supersede the story <laughs> on all the noise that happens and, and, and shape your life, create your life. So it's so interesting. In research that they've done on meditation and mindfulness, mm-hmm. they've discovered that we spend mm-hmm. a large amount of our waking hours in the state that they call mind wandering right? Which um, there's a, there's an actual neuropsychology word for it. And I can never remember it, but it's basically like, we're not, we're, our mind is just going. And oftentimes what it's doing is playing out the past or playing out the future or, you know, wandering down some narrative path that like, oh, this person, you know, about people, about situations, and we don't even realize it's happening. You know, so the, the point of say a mindfulness practice is to realize that's happening come back to a place where you're aware and that coming back is the whole key, right? And so when people teach mindfulness, that's what they're teaching. They're just teaching like, I was in a story, I'm back. I would add, that's important because that's the intervention for me. That's the point where you can be like, oh, I was off on drifting off on some weird story over there. But then it really is a question of like what, what are the stories you want to be telling yourself? And what are the stories Mm -hmm. that you inherited? (laughs) Whether it be genetically, right? Because we do have some epigenetic tendencies. Is it genetically? Is it through your family? Is it through your history? Is it through the society you live in? Um, You know, a lot of the, the, 
implicit bias work that people are doing are really about inherited stories that make us feel something, right? So the, all the Harvard research on implicit bias where they find that, that everyone is, has a bias, what, but what does that mean? I had the pleasure of getting to work um, with a company that, that those researchers were working with also and trying to figure out like, okay, well, what do you do about it? Um, there's stories. Implicit bias is a story that makes your body feel something whether it's this kind of person is scary or, you know, this situation is not for me or whatever, those biases make you feel something. Mm -hmm. So by being a good student of story, you can start to take apart the stories you're telling yourself and think, oh, like the outcome of that, like the, the ah of that, I don't want that. Like, that's not good, right? It might feel familiar, or comfortable, or even good, because oftentimes things that are not great for us too, right, feel that way. But you can say, oh, but then what's my body learning? What, what am I learning from that, right? But until you become a good student of story, you can't take them apart. Mm -hmm. So the first step is just to listen to yourself. Like, what, what are the stories I'm telling? And this is the same, whether you're an individual or you're a company that's having trouble with your media strategy, right? You have to stop and do a story assessment on yourself, your company, your organization, right? I work a lot with, with social justice causes and with activists. And like, they think, oh, well, we're telling our story really well. And I'm like, I think you need to stop and listen to yourselves. Like, what are the takeaways that people are taking from this story? Are they attached? Are there characters? Is there too much data with no feeling? Are you, you know, whatever, like you have to do your story assessment. And once you've listened, which is sometimes awkward and uncomfortable, um, then you can start to say, oh, I don't actually believe that. Like those stories aren't in line with my values. And you can start to build new stories. But since we spend a preponderance of our time wandering around in that sort of haze of story, you wanna learn to be a good like story listener, even for yourself. Like, what, what did I just do that? Like, did I just? You know, um, did I just draw a conclusion that I actually like absolutely don't agree with? And I don't, we don't even know we're doing it, right? So that's step one, become a good story listener for other people, for your customers, for yourself. That's step one. So what's step two? Change the story. You know the three part story, right? What was going on? What did I do about it? What happened? That's the three part story. So this is the book. There's a ton of exercises in this book for doing good story listening, for doing good story shaping, and for doing story for resilience. Mm -hmm. So I'll teach people, you know, retell the story of what of of something as a superpower for yourself. What are my, what are my superpowers? People say mm -hmm. I don't I don't I don't have superpowers. And, you know, I'm not a comic book hero. And I'm like, oh, you have superpowers. Stop and think about what the things people come to you for are. Mm -hmm. What do they ask you for? What do they need from you in your office, in your family, amongst your friends, in your community? And you realize those are your superpowers. You know, my daughter just called me before this call and said, I need you to help me think through the paper I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, of course, that's one of my superpowers. Like, I can help you frame a story. <laughs> Yeah. Right? And it's, it's a superpower, but it's something that benefits other people. Superpowers aren't selfish, right? Yeah, so that's yeah. one of the exercises that I would say to do is to start to, to look at what people ask you for and reframe it as a superpower. Mm -hmm. and, and think about yourself that way as somebody who's mm -hmm. using those powers for good. That's so powerful. I mean, in, in terms of how you're relating uh, to your life your purpose, your, your everything. I mean, it's suddenly, it's like another dimension. Yeah, and, and story, <laughs> here's the thing. Hello, marketers, communicators, people who already use story. You know, a lot of this is probably validating to you, right? This whole conversation probably for the folks who listen and watch your podcast is probably super validating, right? Like I already do that. But here's the thing. And I, and I listen to a bunch of your podcasts, right? So I know this, like people will talk about neuroscience or they'll talk about semiotics or they'll talk about narrative analysis or they'll talk about whatever. And all that stuff, I am utterly fascinated about why, because story does it all for you. 
right? You don't, you don't even have to be an expert in those things. You can become an expert in those things and understand that part of story better. But if you want to do those things better, use story. So it's like a universal, it's like the universal donor <laughs> of, of communication because it already does all those things well. Mm -hmm. At a very basic nuts and bolts level, what's a story? I think that appreciation is not coming. It's just coming in. Because otherwise, you know, I mean, uh, it's like, okay, we, we used a story and used our product. It's, you know, in, in an ad, mm -hmm. we used a story, a 30 second, one minute, etc. But story to uh, convey a value, a very, very significant, complex message. Mm -hmm. You know, like David Acker has written this book and, and the godfather of branding he wrote this book, uh, sorry, okay, Creating Signature Stories for uh, Corporates. And, he, and he's saying this is not one ad. This is not one piece of tactic. It's signature story that is just, that is, uh, that is the most significant message that your corporate culture or value wants to communicate. It's complex. And a story can really, really convey it. So, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you've written a wonderful book, uh, Michelle. And um, I mean, this orientation, because you, you, I mean, you, you've taken it to employees and, and, and relationships and, and uh, I mean, like, like you're mentioning right now, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it can be life transforming. So that's amazing. Now, suppose people think, like you said, people think we already are telling stories. We do it. So, uh, what can a good storyteller learn from a great storyteller? A story, let's, let's not even say good, like an intuitive storyteller who's already doing it can learn from watching other storytellers who are exquisite at it. They can learn what the things are that evoke emotion, right? Which are actually all about what the poet Anne Waldman calls luminous details. So you were saying the sinking ship. Right. Well, what would make a good sinking ship picture is are there icebergs are, you know, is, is it like the, the detail of it absolutely is what makes our bodies feel like the story is real. So you'll learn luminous detail if you see good storytellers. You'll also learn how to build tension, even in a good story. Right. So there's detail, there's tension. And then you'll also learn how to portray the humanity of other people, which is what that connection is based on, the oxytocin is based on. So intuitive storytellers can learn detail, connection, and trouble, basically tension building. And those, those three things elevate your storytelling practice um, in ways that are very satisfying. There's a concept in science fiction called world building, where you're going to build this world that the story is going to take place in. And I think when we talk about branding, that's exactly what we're doing. We're world building. So you're asking all these questions of your clients, however you go about doing them, mm -hmm. to, create, to create branding for them. And what that is, is you're building a world. What are the colors? If you were, an, you know, fruit, what would you be? I mean, you know, whatever you're asking them to try to get, you're really trying to get to what that world feels like, that they're that their brand inhabits or that their brand is the hero of or that their customers are the hero mm -hmm. of that world, however you do it. But so I would also contemplate, read some good science fiction, look at those worlds and it really helps you understand how to do branding. It, isn't it telling us something about how we are evolving, Michelle, how us as a society we are evolving because suddenly the intangible uh, the essence, because a story is also that, isn't it? When, when the emotion, the why, it, it, it's, it's uh, building on, the, it's making the es essence of things more real so you can experience it. I think it's undeniable that in a world where, where holding attention is really difficult, story becomes more powerful. And I feel as though, you know, storytelling has over the millennia helped us find the food we need, you know, be safe from the dangers that we see, build culture, build community, right? And those things don't change. But we're evolving to a place where 
holding attention and, 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 and getting large groups of people to take action is hard. And I think story helps that. All of the research that's being done on political polarization, the first thing you need is a leader. The second thing you need is that that leader to be a good storyteller. So we know it's working in a sort of weird and negative way that, that, the, that the changes that we see that we might not like are being led by story. The talent I was thinking of, which I always think is very strange, is I sew and make all my own clothes. So like, you know, what I'm wearing, everything I make, everything oh. I wear. And, and for me, that, I, you know, story gets woven into that. I mean, it's hard to, but what's going on for me at the time, where I found the fabric, you know, the pattern. I teach sewing to a lot of people. And so did I make mm. it with somebody? And I feel as though I weave into the clothing all of this other mm. stuff so that it takes on great meaning. And I taught my daughter how to sew and she went off to Spain with her partner's family and brought some of the clothes she'd made and some of the clothes that she hadn't made. And she texted me from there and she was like, I don't really wear the other clothes anymore because the oh. ones I've made have so much meaning to me. And so oh. I find myself reaching for them because of the meaning behind them. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I have wow. succeeded. So that's my weird talent. I will say that often when I tell people that they go, and then they start looking at what I'm wearing, like, is that homemade? <laughs> I feel as though I've just revealed like the secret of my soul. You must be prepared for this. <laughs> this is rapid fire. Okay. Mother's best advice. My mother is a psychologist. She's given so much advice to me over the years. <laughs> She's listening. Okay. Another pro alternate profession could have been? Chef. Mm. What would you do on Mars for fun? I would become a spelunker and explore caves. I have to look that up. Okay. As for your daughter, your most often used phrase? I'm so proud of you. Ah. <laughs> Okay. One thing no one knows about you. I used to sit under tables when I was a kid and read books at family events. Oh, such a clear visual that is. <laughs> okay. A book you'd like to gift to all your friends and it can't be your own. Octavia Butler's The Parable of the Sower. What's something new happening in life right now? I got two dogs in the last <laughs> What's your favorite childhood memory? Oh my gosh, I have so many. My current favorite childhood memory is learning um, how to dive off the high diving board at the pool where we grew up. What is your greatest joy? My kids. Mm. How would you like strangers to remember you? Wow, I felt great when I was talking to her. So Michelle, it's a wrap up. I request you to share online addresses, emails, anything you want to do or say about the book. And uh, these links will be there in the show notes as well, but we'd hear it from you. Okay. So my, my website is michelleauerbach.com. That's easy. www.michelleauerbach.com. Um, all my books are there. Other writings, your podcast will go up there when, when it's, when it's been um, posted. The book that we're talking about is Resilience, the Life-Saving Skills Story, which you can get anywhere you buy books, um, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever. It's published by John Hunt. So if you are in the UK or um, Canada, it's very easy to get. Um, I have recently created a course through Sterling College in Vermont that is a training course for change makers and change shapers. And I think that the URL is sterling.edu backslash change. Um, and I have a new book coming out in October or November that's called A Power Greater Than Words, which is- What is it called? The novel, it's called A Power Greater Than Words. Um, it's published by Atmosphere Press and it's a novel about um, a music critic in Chicago. So the breadth of things that you have 
that, and people that you've interviewed is amazing. I was super excited to listen to a bunch of the different speakers on different topics. And I would tell people there's not much out there in the world of marketing that you, and, and branding and this whole communications field that you can't find on this, on this podcast. So if you have not explored, you should find stuff. You should like it. You should listen to the ones that are interesting to you because there will be something out there for anybody and subscribe. Okay. So Michelle, I had such a great time talking to you. It's so amazing, you know, that, I mean, that's one of the joys of doing this, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm very excited <laughs> to be amongst your really cool guests. Yeah.